name of this presentation is called The Hidden Tolls, uh, Why Highways Are Costing South Dallas. Uh, so just to introduce myself, uh, like Evelyn said, my name is Caleb Roberts. I'm a senior planner with Gap Strategies. And my name is Paul Carden. I'm Assistant Vice, Pres Vice President with Venture Commercial. We do retail, restaurants, and uh, entertainment throughout the metro. Um, I also deal with activist development within the city of Dallas itself. So while we getting started here, uh, first, uh, if y'all listen to Jerry and Amber's presentation, that has a lot of great information. I want you to keep that in mind. I'm gonna be referring back to that as we go through uh, our presentation. I want you to look at the screen right now, uh, just at these two images. If you look on the left-hand side, uh, this is uh, North Central Expressway. Uh, we're looking from Royal Lane down to the south. So right now on the left side, that's North Central Expressway looking from Royal Lane south. And on the right, you'll see is South Central Expressway. You can see Forest Theater right there to your right. Um, you're looking uh, going north on MLK. So I want you to keep these images in your mind because they're gonna, uh, we're gonna talk more about what that means. So keep these two images in your mind, uh, North Dallas and South Dallas. So a little bit about myself, I want to kind of introduce why I care about this topic. I am not a Dallas native. Uh, I'm actually from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. But, you know, some of the things that you're dealing with Dallas are very germane to a lot of things that are happening across the country. Uh, I'm an urban planner. I'm also a community organizer. And how I got my start in this is working on highway expansion in Milwaukee. Uh, we have this community in, in Milwaukee called Bronzeville, which uh, both of my parents were raised in. And as you see the images, if you remember what Jerry and Amber were talking about, a lot of the same images exist for this neighborhood as well. Uh, you can see kind of the rich history, jazz, musicians, uh, businesses, and all that. And uh, so I was tasked with organizing around this issue. I-43 was built, um, a highway was built right through the middle image, right through that avenue in the 60s, um, which kind of destroyed that community, and many residents feel uh, affect the future of that community. Um, some 60 years later, that community is, uh, right now, has one of the highest incarceration rates uh, in the country. The zip code 53206 has a, a black male incarceration rate of over 60%. Um, and many residents tie that highway and that removal and uh, if you look at that image right there, in the orange, you'll see where Bronzeville was. After the creation of 43 right there, most of the residents moved north to that 53206 community. Uh, and where do highways go through? Most of your businesses, most of your economic development. So depriving people from the ability to have those businesses and development in their community. Um, overall poor health outcomes, about eight years lower life expectancy in 53206 than the rest of the state. Uh, so, I just want to point that out because although I'm not from Dallas, I now live by I-345, right by Roseland, a stone's throw from 345. And what I learned from doing organizing in Milwaukee is exactly the question that Jerry asked. What is the cost of these highways? We don't talk about it. There's not a framework for text out or anything else to talk about the cost. And that's what we're going to discuss today. So let me frame the issue a little bit for you. Uh, right now, you can see we're talking about Highway uh, Interstate 345, which is just south of Woodall Rogers to uh, I-30. So that's the area of Dallas that we're talking about in the segment of the highway. Um, and what's happening now, TxDOT has confirmed that 345 is going to be in a state of disrepair soon, and changes need to happen in order to make sure it's structurally sound. So uh, in 2016, they commissioned a city map report to talk about options um, that they can do to change the highway. So they have multiple options to change the highway. And as of last year, I believe, they produced a feasibility report to further describe their options and what they think is the future of 345. So the options, I'll go through them. We'll talk a little bit about uh, a few of them, but I want to introduce you into the, all the, the options. Um, so there's five of them. The first is hybrid, which we'll discuss in a future slide. That is what TxDOT states is their preferred option. We also have a no build, which is do nothing. So basically one of the options is just let it fall apart. Uh, 
the next is elevated, which is basically removing some on and off ramps uh, and keeping the highway as it is now. Um, there's also depressed, which is putting it underground. It's kind of uh, below ground. And then the option that we support, which is removal. And we'll kind of go into hybrid and removal. So the hybrid option uh, is basically depressed with some streets over the top. Um, what TxDOT says from their feasibility reports and their city map is that this will produce about $1.2 billion in, in property values. Um, it, they like this because it maintains a connection between South and North Dallas. Um, they also uh, want the streets over the top. If you look at the image, you'll see how they are connecting some of those city streets over the top of the, um, of the depressed highway. Um, but what we look at this option and says, TxDOT is not giving any money for the potential decking of this. So they're depressing the highway and waiting for private development to come and finish the rest. And this is also the most expensive of all the options at a billion dollars. So we feel that this is not giving the, the, re the residents, the neighborhood, any confirmation that something positive will happen and is also the most costly of them. So the option that uh, we support is removal and you look uh, where that highway was where 345 was there's nothing um, this is not this is not exactly what it's going to look like this is just a representation of some of the things that uh, can be done um, so in removal is the best economic development option uh, for the community uh, property values will total about 1.7 billion dollars at build out uh, we're talking about potentially 80 million dollars in new revenue uh, $2.5 billion in new value and creating almost $40,000 in new jobs just from the development that can happen through removal. And it's also about $600 million cheaper than the hybrid option. So it's cheaper and it produces more economic development. But what we believe is to go just beyond that vision of what TxDOT said for removal and enhance that vision. We're talking about restitching communities like um, Amber and Jerry's presentation talking about. We want to restitch some of those things that are lost. And if you look, we would like to extend that removal from just 345 down to 45. And if you look on the right, uh, you'll see that you can remove and replace with boulevards, with economic development, past MLK down to Peabody. Uh, so these are the kind of options that we really want to see. We think this is an opportunity, a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, to reclaim land near downtown, to reclaim land that was taken from communities years ago, and to even go beyond what TxDOT wants to do and build out further. So why does TxDOT like the hybrid option? Mainly because it would like to keep that connection between South and North Dallas. This is what they say over and over again in their reports. We're doing the hybrid option because we cannot increase congestion. We have to make sure capacity does not decrease. And I won't lie to you, removal, as you see here, uh, will increase congestion. So it will increase the amount of time taken to get to South and North Dallas. And we're fine with that. And I will explain why. But that time it takes to get to South and North Dallas, we believe should not be that way anyways. And if it continues to be that way, we'll be inequitable. All congestion isn't created equal, and we'll, we'll talk about that. And how right now that highway is siphoning some of the energy that belongs in South Dallas and moving it north. So with that congestion and with that, Paul's gonna talk about more about that siphoning, but our premise today is that it is increasing congestion, but it will not be equitable continuously if people always have to rely on that highway to get to areas of opportunity. Okay, Paul. All right, so we're gonna have some fun here today. So just for those who are not from Dallas or unfamiliar, let's go back a little bit. So we're talking about 345, of course. That red line, if you see on that map there, that's 345. And you can, I'm showing you here, this is South Dallas, as most people kind of define it, right? But you notice it's a little, little odd. It's kind of southeast, if you will, not directly south of downtown Dallas. Let's reorient ourselves. Let's change our perspective a little bit. South Dallas and Dallas really means downstream on the Trinity River. 
because before Dallas merged with Oak Cliff, it was really all on one side of the river. So from that perspective, it was South Dallas. Now, when you look at that, let's look at where 45 and uh, US 175 merge and cut across South Dallas. And then when you start looking at the perspective, you can kind of understand some of the names. So when you hear Old East Dallas, when you change it where you orient the river is north-south, Old East Dallas starts to make sense in its orientation. North Dallas High School, which is technically a little bit north of downtown or northeast, northwest of downtown Dallas starts to make sense. South Dallas makes sense. And then Oak Cliff was really its own thing until they merged in the late 1800s. Now, with that in mind, really, South Dallas is a peninsula. And a lot of people don't realize this because when you start factoring in the Trinity River and its current course, the Great Trinity Forest, the drainage from White Rock, White Rock Lake, and its drainage, and as it goes and merges with the Trinity River, there's really only one direction you can go from South Dallas, and that is basically to the north, northeast. That's it. And so, in theory, that should be a huge benefit to South Dallas. That means all of the traffic that is coming into South Dallas would have to go there, and thus, when you, have, when you control a key choke point, retail and restaurants and business love being at a key intersection. They like seeing traffic. They like knowing that people are going to be traveling through here because the more people that travel through there, the more business they can have. That is opportunity. That is wealth creation. That is something that every community generally wants to see. But that's not what's happening here. With 345 in combination with a portion of 45, what it's actually doing is separating all the traffic that would go from South Dow into South Dallas and patronize those businesses and draining it to North Dallas. You remember that first picture we saw where we saw an empty vacant land in North Dallas and cutting across South Dallas? That is really the effect of taking all of the economic pressure and literally just draining it through the highway into North Dallas. Development in retail and restaurants, they're gonna generally going to go with the path of least resistance. And by using this infrastructure in combination with other policies, the path of least resistance shifted from building within the city and close in to the benefit of South Dallas and its minority residents to the advantage of North Dallas. And that's what creates this, unbalance, this imbalance that we see today. Now, if you want to believe me, well, this is not just draining. This is not just a, oh, it's not that bad. It's just a highway, right? We have other highways. Let me give you an example of what that drain looks like. It's a little bit hard to see here. I, did, I should have zoomed that in a bit more, but Botham Jean Lamar Boulevard, just under 11,000 vehicles a day, and that's going kind of along the riverfront in South Dallas, right? This was rush hour. I took this at 8.30 a.m. on a weekday. That's rush hour on Lamar. Texas 310, not even 10,000 vehicles a day. This was, before the creation of I-45, its primary access point coming in from Far East Oak Cliff, if you were trying to get across the river. Cesar Chavez going into downtown, barely over 10,000 vehicles a day. Good Latimer, quote unquote, expressway, rush hour traffic, 4,000 vehicles a day. Remember, 345 carries 175,000 vehicles a day. TxDOT loves to parade that number. And this is what South Dallas is left with. Harwood going directly from MLK to downtown, not even 2,500 vehicles a day. And this is pre-pandemic. And you want to see what the difference is, where it's draining to? Look at what happens in the north. Walnut Hill in 75, 36,000, almost 37,000 vehicles a day just on that road alone. Mockingbird, 43,000 vehicles a day. You want to see where those economic dollars, that opportunity, that retail is going? That's exactly where it's going. Inwood Boulevard, 55,000 vehicles a day on an arterial street. And, we will, and, and yet, we're hearing from TxDOT right now. We hear from the fear and the concern that we couldn't handle the traffic, that South Dallas could not absorb the traffic. That traffic is money that is literally going right out of South Dallas on an overpass straight into the wallets and the opportunity of those who are living in North Dallas. So, you want to know what the exception is in South Dallas? Robert B. Cullum, right by the fair. And I can tell you from working with retail, I know exactly why. It is the only street, major street here, that does not intersect 45. It does not intersect directly with this, with this highway that is siphoning traffic. And, you know, and that's shown because it's the only one that can get above 20,000 vehicles a day. The only location of McDonald's, the Fiesta, the drive, the only national tenants for the most part are concentrated at MLK and Robert B. Cullen because it's the only intersection in South Dallas that gets above 30,000 vehicles a day. 
That is what we're seeing time and time again with this with process like this. So when you ask yourself that, what is that? That's, that's the real effect of 345. And if you want to see what that results in, I'm going to let Caleb explain the, the stats that brings you to. For sure. And like we were saying before, TxDOT is saying that they need to improve this highway through their hybrid option because otherwise South Dallas will struggle. They're saying that without the highway, South Dallas will struggle. And we're going to go through some things to see where is the current state of South Dallas? How is that highway improving? And we talked about cost. Let's see the real effects of this to see how South Dallas is faring. So look at this map right here. Um, you'll see this is the percent of black population. Uh, as the shades get darker, as the colors get darker, more intense, that means a higher percentage of black uh, people in that area. So if you look right down the 45 channel, you'll see a lot of concentration of, um, of black residents, black households. I want you to keep that uh, kind of geometry in mind when we go through these next slides, where black people are. Let's look at people below the poverty line, the federal poverty line. If you look at the more intense colors, the darker the colors, uh, the higher amount of people that are in poverty, right down 45 moving south. You see, as you cross 30, you can see how those, those uh, intensities get more, how the concentration of poverty gets more intense. The next, we're going to look at the inverse. You look at median household income and, and median home values. So the darker the color, the higher the value. Now, you see how that kind of flips on its head? You see how the more intensity is headed north there? and how the lighter colors are right along 45. So where you see that black, uh, black population to the south, now you see no intensity. You see none of the higher end incomes and values. <clears throat> and then number one is the, the mean uh, travel time to work. So travel time to work talks about if you have a longer travel time to work, it increases stress. Uh, increases difficulty in doing other things. If you have to go get kids from daycare, if you have a second job, uh, all these other things, it makes it harder to move around your city. Now, if you look at a highway, the number one thing a highway is supposed to do is benefit your travel times. Now, look at this map. You go from green to red, green having the lowest travel times, red having the highest travel times. What area of Dallas do you think is benefiting from the current infrastructure, road infrastructure? North Dallas. So already, just in the present day, we've talked about the history. If you listen to Jerry and Amber's presentation, they talked about the history and how much it cost, you know, uh, the, the Freedmen's Towns, the historic black communities, some historic brown communities. And you can see right now, the effect of that is to benefit the people in the north who now have short travel times to get downtown and do what they want to do, while residents of South Dallas and as you go further south, where that black population follow, have to try to get it in the hardest way possible. And some of what we're trying to do is make it easier for people to get places. That is opportunity, the ease, the lack of friction. And so <clears throat> Paul will talk about what's going on next. Thank you. So, you know, we, we talked about it more, and really there, there are really two major issues with Texas plan and why it doesn't really serve South Dallas. If all you're doing is just expanding the existing highway or rebuilding it, you might not even really be expanding, just rebuilding it, but in a trench, the drain is still there. You're still siphoning off traffic, right? So structurally, what has changed for South Dallas other than the look of the highway? And it's not even changing the look of the highway in South Dallas. It's changing it in the core within Deep Ellum and, that, and, and downtown of Deep Ellum. Not that that's not a valid thing to look at. But since the concern seems to be so much about what will be best for South Dallas, how does trenching a highway in downtown improve South Dallas? And the other thing is that it really doesn't add any innovation to what TxDOT has done. I have, I have, this is not my first rodeo with TxDOT. I have been... Uh, fortunate to work on the Southern Gateway Project, which is a major reconstruction of Interstate 35E in Dallas, right? We shrunk the right of way there. There was working on the deck park and all these other different improvements and betterments. And that was an actual interstate that's going from Mexico to Canada, where there really was perhaps no other better option, right? Interstate 45 and 345 doesn't even leave the state. It connects Dallas and Houston, and that's about it. 
And we have examples of TxDOT doing better and coordinating better. Central Expressway, the thing that 345 connects to, in the north, they rebuilt that no higher, no wider, in a trench, and at the same time, they built them the only subway station in, the, in, the, in this region, in the southwest, while they were building this out. All of that was going on simultaneously so that they would have multimodal transport in one, in, in a single decade, they went from a two-lane highway to multimodal transport, subway system, uh, significant landscaping, all in one go. And that's just what they did in the 90s. Then, in the you know, late 2000s, early 2010s, we have Clyde Warren Park. Clyde Warren did not add any road capacity, didn't make it any, any, any wide or anything like that. It turned some of the worst real estate, coincidentally, right next to the highway in downtown and uptown Dallas, into the best real estate by connecting it with green space. Then you have the Southern Gateway that I've worked on. That was a project, that was a project similar where we had you know, demolitions and a lot of right-of-way that was taken from a lot of minority neighborhoods back in the 50s and 60s. This was reconstructed where it actually shrunk its right-of-way through the core of Oak Cliff. And not only that, not only are we getting a deck park, before a single patch of grass is laid, there is more affordable housing and mixed income housing going up within a mile of the park than you started with. In other words, before there's even any concern about displacement, there's already replacement with newer, better, safer housing than what you began with. At the same time, you're adding infrastructure. At the same time, you're adding green space. And yet, we come back to the conclusion that this is somehow an improvement. We're going to trench a freeway and maybe kind of sort, I don't know, we might eventually get you a deck park. Good luck, guys. That's, that's, I don't believe that TxDOT has really thought this as well as they could. I think that the city, considering it is a top five metro in the country, should expect better of its transportation authority. And I think South Dallas and the city as a whole deserves better. And there are plenty of other infrastructure needs within South Dallas. It's 1.2 billion, right, to, you know, trench this freeway. There are plenty of other things to apply that 1.2 billion to. Not all of it necessarily needs to be on TxDOT's hands. Just as an example, since we're talking so much about where Southern, how Southern Dallas can go from point A to point B, you have a ring road. You've upgraded all of this infrastructure in the north with 635 and its ring road. Interstate 20 has been the same as it's been since at least the late 80s. Actually in Southern Dallas County, actually near a inland port where there are a lot of trucks that actually have no choice but to drive. And yet that is not seeing the same in investment that we're seeing in the north. But the inner city freeway is the one that's a priority. Even looking at the local connections, Lamar and Bonton. Bonton Farms and that entire community is effectively cut off because of inner, uh, uh, Texas 310 and the connection. It disconnects it from Lamar. So that means if someone was trying to visit that community from the convention or something downtown, they have to zig and zag their way through the city, through, the, through other communities, and it isolates Bonton and keeps them away from retail jobs and opportunities that they would otherwise have easier access to. There are simple connections like that. Corinth Street Underpass, even it's going into South Dallas, you know, we're talking about something where, okay, we have all these bridges and stuff, and then we cut it down to a single lane of actual road on the ground where you could have retailers and shops. You don't turn onto an interstate directly into a grocery store, um, your, your home and stuff. That's, that's not how, you actually have to, at some point, you do have to get onto a street and park or walk or get out of your vehicle and actually go to a place. And there are so many of these other infrastructure investments that you could do. Lamar itself, you have a rail line that is actively used in a rail corridor. What's stopping DART in the city from coordinating and saying, why don't you just take that exact same rail line, work on some right-of-way directly adjacent to it, and put a parallel DART line going straight down Lamar? You don't have to do anything that complicated. Just go in a straight line. And you know what the really cool thing about that is? We've talked many times, and you've heard many of the speakers before talk about how much acreage opens up because of removing I, the potential for removing I-345. Do you know how many acres are over down there in that white highlighted area? Over 400 acres. Do you know what you can put in 400 acres at even a moderate density? At 100 units an acre, which is like a little five-story wrap where we see kind of day in and day out, you put some retail on. That's 40,000 housing units that you could put and I haven't touched a single blade of single family homes. You haven't gone into, you haven't really disrupted MLK. You haven't really done anything like that. And you know what you could do with 20% of 40,000 housing units? You could have enough affordable housing for literally every single current resident of South Dallas. There's only about a little more than 20,000 residents remaining within South Dallas. The city, Texas, 
has more, they have more than enough ability to do improvements beyond just improving, working on this freeware, saying we just need to trench this. And so, you know, that's really the thing that we need to look at is how do you, how do you, how do you change the dynamics of where you are, you're getting this traffic and getting this, this activity to benefit South Dallas. Part of the other thing too about this is that by having that connection with Interstate 45 and 345 and skewing that traffic away, what you end up seeing is that, you know, underutilized properties like the entire Lamar corridor, right? Underutilized properties on many of the other major north-south corridors that could support housing, could support retail, effectively go unutilized. And South Dallas residents and the community ultimately loses out. Um, so by changing that, that dynamic, by changing where the path of least resistance is, that is how, I, how you can really drive that growth. So what we talked about today is really why TxDOT uses the term congestion as a fear tactic. You won't be able to get the things that you need. But we understand why South Dallas has had its economic development, has had its culture extracted. And so when they say it's going to make it harder for you to get to these resources, we've already shown how difficult it is for South Dallas to get to those resources, how they're faring with those resources that they have in their grasp. It's not something sustainable. So when you ask yourself, okay, it's going to increase congestion, but is the current state of affairs something that South Dallas, South Dallas is dealing well with? And the answer would be no. It's slowly and, and increasingly taking more and more away from that fabric. So I want to refer back to this picture. This is from the 1950s, remember. On the left, you have North Central Expressway, Royal Lane, looking south. On the right, you have South Central Expressway uh, by Forest Theater, looking north from MLK. That image on the right is South Dallas in the 50s. The image on the left is North Dallas. Now, what community in the 50s looked more intact? What looked more solid? What had a higher base? Now, tell me what those communities look like today. And explain to me who is benefiting from the highway. And so what we want to take away from this is we're going to have a panel of city council members talking later. Uh, we want, uh, what we would like is for a report, a more analysis to be done on the economic development potential of removal. We would like to increase TxDOT's uh, option of removal and extend it to 45 so we can really, truly restitch Southern Dallas. And the premise here is just there are a lot of options, but is that the highest and best that we can do? And why should we be shooting for minimal things when we know there's so much work to be done? So if you take anything away from here, it's let's go further than just status quo because we know the history and we have an opportunity. Like I said, downtown land doesn't become available often. And think of all the things you can do uh, with a, a particular area like that, with the history and all the things that, the opportunities that we have moving forward. Um, so Paul and I will be up here for Q&A. Uh, that's the presentation. I appreciate you all for, for coming and showing up. <laughs> questions, questions, anybody? Jerry? You all, that was a really good presentation. The city council should have sat in on this one. Um, my question is more of a, a historic question, particularly about this peninsula. It's the first time I heard South Dallas being called a peninsula, That's but it answer. makes a lot of sense if you drive down 45 and you see like the, the heavy industry separating a whole community and the, the forest. Um, my question is, um, when South Dallas became a black community, when white flight happened, uh, did that peninsula effect uh, increase? Um, or was it always, always there? Because South Dallas as a city, I mean, Dallas as a city developed south before it moved north. Um, the, when you take the peninsula effect and you need to combine it with Interstate 30 in particular, right, it makes it easier to contain, right? If you said, okay, I'm going to take this one section of the city and just kind of ignore it, Right, and it's already bounded on three sides by, you know, natural boundaries, most of it like water and forest. That actually makes, that can make it easier to, to cut off and ignore a section of the city. <laughs> Just to follow up, 
the how did you all determine the um, the vehicles? I know it came from a report, but how did you all determine that as a metric to determine how the drain, the economic drain was happening, the vehicles um, throughout the corridors? Because I think that was uh, very brilliant. Yeah, so funny enough, TxDOT has traffic counts for all these different corridors, so we can check that all the, you know, pretty much, you know, pretty easily. The, the way you kind of look at it is essentially, if you take a Google Maps or you take any kind of GPS and say, How's, what's the fastest way to get from point A to point B? And for no matter whether you're coming from Oak Cliff or Pleasant Grove, it will always tell you basically whether you're going to 35 or Central to kind of do this zigzag using 175 and 45 and 345. That zigzag basically means that you kind of skip Lamar, for example. Instead of going the short route, you're going what could be, in theory, the fast route. And if everyone chooses the same route that's fast and it doesn't scale very well, as cars don't, uh, you get all that congestion. And it looks like, well, there's so much traffic, but what it really is is it's everyone going for the exact same fire exit door because this one door has a double door and everything else is a single door. That's really what, what we, what, what's really kind of causing that effect. So to undo that, you'd want to do something where the choice that people are making is for, if I'm going, coming from 45, going to 35, some of those people should be going on Lamar because that's physically shorter. And by removing some of that highway section, you can also make it an equal or more likely slightly faster method. And that, again, it lets South Dallas businesses and property owners who are mostly minority right now have a chance to benefit economically from the traffic that goes through their communities every day. And just to follow up on that, like, uh, like we were saying before, all congestion isn't created equal. When you talk about congestion, you think about sitting in traffic on the highway, somebody done crashed, car done blown up, all kind of crazy stuff that happens, and you're just sitting there. On a residential street, congestion is not the same thing. I, I told this story to them, but that's how I found um, some of the tuxes when I got married was getting in traffic and being like, oh, I'm going to go check this store out, see what's going on because of the options available to you when you're sitting in residential streets. You can pull off to the side and go get food. You can stop, get your hair cut. You can go and do something else, go get gas, all these other options. On the highway, you have one particular, from A to B. Residential streets means that you have a multitude of options. So for an area that is lacking demand, lacking, lacking economics, how are you gonna get those people in those stores? And if you don't have the traffic, these are what this is what businesses look at. How are they going to get people in their doors? And if you don't have the traffic, you're not going to be able to build and maintain the businesses that you want. Uh, my question, well, I'll comment first is, I mean, one, you know, we've been talking about cars, but then, of course, people think of, I think a lot of people think of dart riders as sort of like, you know, white, weird guys like me, but when you actually ride on dart, you know, obviously most of the people on there are black and brown who need that, you know, to get to their jobs. You know, the lowest rate of car ownership in of any Dallas zip code is South Dallas, 552, 75215. So I guess my question sort of just relates to that is, do you, have you looked at all, has like traffic times, not traffic times, have commute times been increasing over time also for south and southern dallas residents like you know has, yeah. has that been getting worse and worse over time you want to go first go ahead so you say i just i couldn't quite hear everything but it was, you were asking about the south dallas do we expect commute times to increase over time so you talk you know you showed how southern dallas has the longest commute times right now right do you know if has that problem been getting worse right because obviously we keep building north and north and north. So, you know, have you done any research into whether this problem keeps getting worse and worse? We have. Um, I do that part of my, as part of my job, right? We look at what we might consider the center of gravity. In other words, where can you draw the greatest number of people uh, within, you know, 10, 15, 30 minutes, right? And right now, if I was to drop a pin and say, where could I draw the largest base within 30 minutes? It's the center of gravity is roughly a little bit north of Addison, kind of by the Galleria Mall, which is almost directly north of about 10 miles north of downtown Dallas. And that center of gravity kind of shifts further and further north. So yes, those commute times would increase. To a close-in neighborhood like, like South Dallas or a close-in community, 
they don't work well by chasing after, you know, stuff going further and further north. They work well by drawing things to them, right? Um, it's kind of like if you had a soccer player that you suddenly just placed and, you know, had them play center in the NBA, right? It doesn't mean they're not an athlete, right? But they're better, but the natural setup for a close-in neighborhood is to have convenience. It wouldn't matter to them as much to go an hour to Plano or something, not that that's the case right now, but they would rarely need to go more than 15, 20 minutes away because they stay, everything is close range. And chasing, trying to play a suburban game as an urban neighborhood will almost always result in loss for that urban neighborhood. I, I think as a planner, it's a, it's a tough sell to talk about road and infrastructure projects because they're identified as helping people out. We're gonna build a, a larger highway to help you get somewhere quicker. And there's no data, and DFW is growing tremendously. We all know that. There is no roadway infrastructure project that will currently help your travel time. So if your travel time right now is 38 minutes, there is no infrastructure project road-wise, not considering transit, that will, that will decrease your travel time in the, in the future. The best thing a road infrastructure project is can make it less bad in the future. I, want, I hope you all understand that. So it's not decreasing your travel times. Some of these things will just make it less bad. The only way to counteract that is what Paul is saying, is to bring things closer to you. Because if you're relying on traveling, uh, traversing DFW to get to places, and you have to go 38 minutes, in 10 years it'll be 45, in 20 it'll be 55, no matter how much money you throw at it, because of the amount of people that are coming. So it, it's again a hard way to, to get people to understand that you're not getting a benefit, you're just getting less of a negative with infrastructure projects. And we need to start putting some things in the positive column, and that's why we're talking about removal, because you can build space that are, is closer to people. You can build things that they need closer to people, and that's the only way to kind of beat what's happening in DFW right now. Hi, uh, my name is Pablo, I'm with KERA, and um, thank you so much for the presentation. I, I hope that I didn't miss this because I was a little late, but um, I did want to ask, you know, there's a lot of talk of this removal option of I th I-345, and I just want to know what, what do y'all envision um, if that removal option were to happen? Well, I, I, I'll touch on that really quick because we have that diorama right there to get your, the imagination moving about what can be done uh, through removal, but I, ideally just looking from a planning perspective, I think you have so much things happening in downtown and Deep Ellum and South Dallas that are not connected right now. We have a chance for trails, uh, you know, bike paths, uh, places, uh, restaurants, retail, all these things that people love to go to that can be in a connection through their parks and open space, places for people to be. And I just think uh, ideally removing just the car centric version and having people comfortable walking around and moving is a, a major thing, but also culturally. I think the federal government is moving. They have a reconnecting communities grant that is really looking at restitching communities. And I think we have a specific time in American history where we can talk about cultural things. We can talk about building black businesses and cultural districts more than we ever had in the past. And there's ways we can do that. Community land trust, uh, TIF districts that can kind of uh, codify and making sure that we have that cultural center uh, somewhere here in Dallas and we have that opportunity. Okay, I have a follow up to that. Um, do you think any of that is possible with the entrenched, uh, the tunneled option? I, look, I, I don't think it is. I, I don't think there's any guarantees. And that's the, the number one thing is there's no guarantees that that is going to build out in the way it is. And the number one uh, biggest thing is with highways, that speed of travel, if you look at the, um, at the hybrid option, you still have cars moving at 55 miles per hour. You still have cars trying to get onto the expressway. And anywhere that happens is gonna be uh, a deterrent for people to walk. If you have a kid in your, in your stroller, are you gonna wanna deal with a car speeding up to 55 miles per hour to get onto an expressway, wherever that is? You have to make it for safe for people to be there. And I think removal is just a more responsible way and the best way because people need that space. We see it other places that people want that space to congregate and we can do that, so not take a half measure. We have an opportunity to do all these things. Why take a half measure when you can go all the way? Thank you. Uh, we have like 
two minutes and 45 seconds. So if somebody got a quick question, that would be great. None, none. Okay, thank you. Appreciate yeah, you all. Appreciate it. Thank you.